Hello and welcome to Roots and Shoots. We're continuing our studies in the book of Revelation and we're on chapter 6. So I hope you have it there ready in your Bible and we'll read it through together. Revelation chapter 6. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures, saying, A kilogram of wheat for a day's wages, and three kilograms of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed, just as they had been. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Let's pray. Father, as we look at your word together now, we're into some quite strange passages, it seems. But Lord, these have been written to help us to understand more about the time that we're living in and about what's coming in the future. So as we study what this passage has to teach us, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would comfort our hearts, that you would prepare us to be those who stand firm right until the end. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have uh, chapter 6, which is six of seven seals that are opened. If you remember when we were studying last week, we we saw Jesus who appeared like a lamb who had been slain and he was the only one who was worthy to open the scroll uh, that was there in heaven. And now he's opening it. So as the lamb opens the first of the six seals, we see lots of things happening here. So if you just follow through with me in this chapter, um, what we've got is when the first seal is broken, it says, there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. 
Incidentally, uh, as I've been reading up the background and the commentaries on, on uh, all of the things that happen with these seals, there are some who would uh, uh, interpret the first rider as being Jesus himself. And they do that primarily because he's dressed in white and also because if you look at Revelation 19, we are introduced to Jesus as a rider on a horse and he's dressed in white. And you can uh, flick through to Revelation 19 and see that for yourself uh, if you'd like to. But the general consensus is that no, the fact that the rider is dressed in white is, I'm not going to say coincidental, but it's not um, something that we need to interpret as believing that this is about Jesus. And there are several reasons for that, not least, as we'll see as we go through the book of Revelation, is that this pattern is repeated elsewhere. So when we go from the seals to the trumpets and as we go on through the book, we will we will see the same sort of pattern happening. And in none of the other places would you interpret the first occurrence uh, as being that of Jesus. Having said that, uh, those who believe this have some compelling arguments. Uh, and what they are saying is that this rider going out to conquer is Jesus going out to uh, spread his message and to win people to his side. Um, well, I don't share that interpretation. What I see here is somebody going out to conquer the earth. And we'll uh, reflect a little bit later on when this may be happening. But here, this is somebody who is conquering, but only with permission. Notice, first of all, that the seal can only be broken by the lamb. So if Jesus doesn't break this seal, then this rider doesn't go out. But also notice that although he held a bow, he was given a crown. He was given some kind of authority and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Then we've got the second seal. And when that was opened, we have a fiery red horse. And again, its rider is given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. And to him was given a large sword. What's going on here is go only going on because of what the lamb has done and with the lamb's authority. In Verse five, the third seal. And I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a kilogram of wheat for a day's wages and three kilograms of barley for a day's wages. And do not damage the oil and the wine. When we have the picture of the scales. This is uh, often used in the Bible as a picture of scarcity, of things that are being found wanting. And in this case, it's the food. Why? Because this seal is talking about famine. Although it isn't that there is no food available, it's that the price of food has gone up. And the commentators tell me that the price of a day's wages for a kilogram of wheat was roughly 10 times what you would have paid for that at the time that John was writing. These were grossly inflated prices because of scarcity. We have some of that going on around us today, don't we? Um, but here, the, the message of the seal is that there is famine that people are struggling to buy enough to live on. And they tell me that a kilo of wheat would feed a person for a day. Three kilos of barley, which is a cheaper grain, uh, would feed a family for a day. And therefore, whoever's working to buy the wages is only able to earn enough just to barely feed himself or herself uh, and the family. 
And then we come to the fourth seal in verse 7. And I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. So we have this pale horse and the horse is called Death and Hades follows behind. Uh, perhaps another time we'll look at what Hades means in the Bible. It's the place of the dead and it's almost as if uh, when unbelievers die they go to this place called Hades awaiting the final judgment and as Revelation will tell us later in the book actually there comes a point at which death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire uh, and brimstone. Then we have the fifth seal and when he opened the fifth seal it says I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So when we have the fifth seal opened, we see martyrs, they're under the altar, a place of protection where they're protected by the blood and they're calling on God. They're not calling out of vengeance, but they're calling for justice because they know that the judge of all the earth will do right and that God is going to avenge their blood. And they're saying, Lord, when is it going to be? And he says, just be patient, because actually there are more people to be added to your number. Martyrdom is not something accidental. It's not something that's not part of God's plan. And one of the reasons I believe why the book of Revelation has been written, and much of the rest of scripture, is to tell us that Christians are not called to an easy life. And there are times when we will suffer for Christ. And there may even be times when we are called to give our lives for him. But that's not defeat. That's victory. And then we come on to the sixth seal. In verse 12, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat's hair. The whole moon turned, to, turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Now, uh, if we're familiar with other passages in the Bible, this, this language of the, the sun being darkened and the, the moon being turned to blood, and uh, this really dramatic imagery, we see time and again referring to God's day of judgment. I've just printed out here uh, Isaiah chapter 34. Those verses that we've just read when it talks about the um, the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. And then it talks about the, um, uh, the stars in the sky falling to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Well, listen to Isaiah 34. And verse 4, it says, All the st stars in the sky will be dissolved, and the heavens rolled up like a scroll. All the starry host will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like shriveled figs from the fig tree. Let's always remember, especially when we're looking at uh, passages like this, that there are other passages that we can draw on to try and understand more about what these things mean. And so it is that there are other passages that talk to us about the horsemen. And for your bit of digging this week, what I'd like you to do, and I'm just going to uh, switch screens so that I can put these up for you if I can find my mouse. Here we go. So uh, here are some passages in 
a other parts of the Bible. So Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 12 to 23, Zechariah chapter 1, 7 to 10, chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, and then the words of Jesus, which we may be more familiar with in Matthew 24, when the disciples are talking to him about the end times. What I'd like you to do is hit the pause button, have a look at these passages and see what you can find similar in those passages to what we've been reading here in Revelation chapter 6. So hit the pause button and I'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back. So let's just go through these passages uh, and see what we've got. In Ezekiel, and I only listed the passages in biblical order. So Ezekiel chapter 14, it says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful, and I stretch out my hand against it to cut off its food supply and send famine upon it, and kill its peoples and animals, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, Daniel and Job, were in it, they could only save themselves. So there we have famine. In verse 15, if I send wild beasts through that country, and it becomes desolate so that no one can pass through it. In verse 17, if I bring a sword against that country, Verse 19, if I send a plague into that land and pour my wrath on it through bloodshed, killing its people and their animals, even if Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, they could save neither son nor daughter. They would save only themselves by their righteousness. And then in verse 21, this is what the sovereign Lord says. How much worse will it be? When I send against Jerusalem my four dreadful judgments, sword and famine and wild beasts and plagues to kill its men and their animals, yet there will be some survivors, sons and daughters, who will be brought out of it. Can you see the similarities there with the, the plagues that we were thinking about in chapter 6? Zechariah chapter 1. And... Uh, we're introduced in verse 7 to the time when Zechariah is given this word from God. And it says in verse 8, During the night I had a vision, and there before me was a man mounted on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown and white horses. I asked, What are these, my lord? The angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you what they are. Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, they are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. So can you see how the this picture of horses, riders on horses, are uh, those sent by God to carry out his purposes in the world? And just flicking over to Zechariah chapter 6, I looked up again. And there before me were four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black, the third white and the fourth dappled, all of them powerful. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel answered me, these are the four spirits of heaven going out from standing in the presence of the Lord of the whole world. So. We could take quite a long time just drawing out. There are some subtle differences between the descriptions, the colours. So in one of them, for instance, there were two red horses. In another of them, instead of a pale horse, there was a dappled horse. Now, those are not necessarily contradictions. They may just be slight differences in perception. But uh, we could look at all of this and just, I hope, from all this, get the message that this is about God working out his purposes in the world and that when Christians suffer we have to understand that this is part of of what God is doing in these end times and it may be that God is even calling us to make up the numbers of the martyrs that sounds a terrible thing to say 
that this is clearly what's here in the scripture, that we need to be faithful unto death if necessary. If we look at Matthew 24, where we have the the um, disciples asking Jesus about the destruction of the temple. And they say, when is this going to happen? He says in verse four, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pangs. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. These are the beginnings of birth pains. Imagine what's going to be born. And think of those uh, latter seals where it talks about the heavens being rolled up like a scroll. Uh, and the stars falling out of place. As in that final day God brings about the new heavens and the new earth wherein righteousness dwells. When does all this start? Well, if you remember, when John looked in heaven, there was no one worthy to open the scroll. And then Jesus came and he was seated on his throne and he was worthy to open the scroll. And we know the truth of scripture is that when uh, Jesus rose again and when he ascended to the father's side, we're told that he was he was given the name that is above every name, that he's there, seated on his throne by God, even now, and has been since that day. And therefore, what's happening here with these seals, we can easily understand, is what's been going on throughout history, ever since the resurrection of Christ. And if we look at the, the what those seals are about, we can actually see that uh, God is, these things have been happening um, all the way through. Let me go back to uh, my screenshot here because I think, here we go. Here are, the, here are the seals. We've got conquest, we've got strife, we've got famine, we've got death, we've got persecution. And ultimately we have judgment. And I think we can safely say that that describes history. Um, certainly since the time of the resurrection. See, Christ is sorting out his true followers. This is the promise that we have. That the redemption has happened, but God is refining his true disciples. And at the same time, he's hardening the hearts of unbelievers. The seals are not the signs of the end. They're commonplace throughout history. And the reason why Revelation uh, shows these things to the Christians, uh, not just the Christians in those churches, but to all who have ears to hear, if you remember. So that's you and me as well, is to say, don't be alarmed by this going on. Understand that God is at work. These things are not unexpected. In fact, they've been foretold. And what's going on is a certainty just as our future hope is a certainty as well. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that, that you've uh, told us ahead of time the kind of things that we might have to suffer and go through as your followers. Give us courage, Lord, to face whatever life may bring and give us hope, knowing that you have promised and that we can trust in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us this week. Uh, I hope that that's been a blessing to you. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great week.